Broadcasting from beautiful, tropical Vero Beach, Florida, it's Money Nation with Ed Gardner. Good morning and welcome to Money Nation. Today's special guest, we have Deborah Tanetti and Ark Dudek. They're co-founders of TTC Oncology. Guys, thank you for being with us on Money Nation. Good morning. Guys, we're going to start off here. Uh, let us give us a better understanding of the type of breast cancer and the available treatments today that you guys are using. Um, so there, you know, there are some broad categories um, that we can sort of um, describe. The largest subsection of uh, breast cancers express the estrogen receptor and they're called ER positive breast cancers. And that accounts for about 70 to 75% of all breast cancers. And, and uh, the, the estrogen receptor drives the growth of the tumor. And there are a number of drugs that are targeted towards the receptor. Um, other subtypes include um, HER2 positive, which is really a, a receptor that's located on the, the membrane of the tumor cell. And that accounts for about 15% uh, of all breast cancers. And then there's a triple negative subset, which don't really express any targetable, um, any drug targetable um, sites. So um, that accounts for about 10%, 10 to 15%. How did you, you got an interesting story involving uh, Princess Diane, um, some high level science. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and uh... How did that fit into the TTC story? Sure. In 1986, Princess Diana visited Chicago. And at the time, I was working for um, and with Dr. Craig Jordan, Dr. V. Craig Jordan, who is the scientist who really brought the drug tamoxifen from the laboratory to the clinic. And um, at the time, uh, Princess Diana was visiting three um, universities and cancer centers uh, in Chicago, and Northwestern was one of them. Um, and my mentor, Craig Jordan, at the time was named the Princess Diana uh, Professor of Cancer Research. And so I really got my start in learning about um, resistance to tamoxifen from learning from Dr. Craig Jordan. And um, so that is where um, I really got the training in how to study resistance and how to build some models that allowed us to eventually, I took uh, my research to the University of Illinois, Chicago, and that is where TTC really got uh, developed, along with uh, Greg Thatcher, who is uh, also at UIC and our Dudek. Can you explain in some small words and simple terms for our listeners some of the terminology associated with breast cancer? And it can be awful confusing for uh, listeners. A uh, little uh, uh, background on that. It's an interesting subject. Eric, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so breast cancer um, uh, origins, originates in, in breast and then it can uh, grow uh um, uh, grows sometimes slowly, sometimes in a, in a fast pace. And when it is still localized to the breast, you know, the idea here is to remove it uh, surgically. Um, sometimes we'll require some additional treatments before or after uh, the surgical re uh, removal. Unfortunately, um, uh, especially in when we deal with uh, estrogen receptor pathway that, that is driving a lot of breast cancer in the United States, a lot of women that had surgery have disease coming back. Uh, and at that point, uh, we need to design treatments that are going to be effective. Hormonal treatments, hormones meaning that's, that's estrogen, it's a hormone, or hormonally targeted treatment that is going to be decreasing, usually decreasing activity of that hormone that stimulates breast cancer cell growth um, is a very key uh, management nowadays of patients with estrogen receptor positive or hormonal breast cancer. The strategy is very effective of maintaining uh, 
shrinking the tumor sometimes, but a lot of times this tumor starts growing again and becomes resistant. And at that time, chemotherapy is used in order to stop further growth of the tumor. And of course, toxicity, side effects of treatments are much worse than just hormonal therapy. So in that context, we we were very much interested to sort of intervene at that level, at that moment where you had a breast cancer becoming resistant to typical standard treatments that is available today. So it's getting stronger, it's, it's getting stronger as it evolves. Yes, it is. Uh, it it is. It, it continues to change. It overcomes the way. It sometimes there are specific proteins that are changed by uh, mutation of DNA in those uh, breast cancer cells, and it's a it's an evolution from initially sensitive to hormonal therapy tumor to eventually overcoming that suppression that is being given by hormonal treatment. Guys, can you tell us a little background about how you guys got started, your your background, and uh, how you came to form uh, TCC Oncology? So I think sure. Deborah should should probably give uh, some, uh, uh, information about the whole basic biology research that she's done, as well as the Greg Thatcher, and I'm going to talk a little bit more of how we got things together in the context of uh, building the company and doing a first trial in human patients. Yeah, so I think that I mentioned that there were some uh, mouse models that uh, were central to really discovering sort of the resistance mechanism, uh, first to tamoxifen. And, and so these, uh, we take cells from breast cancer cells that are human breast cancer cells and we inject them into mice, we form a tumor. And so these are really um, an avatar uh, that can recapitulate what happens in, in a patient. And so as um, you know, there's a, an evolution of resistance that, that Arup just mentioned in terms of uh, a lot of changes in the DNA and uh, often the tumor cells try to evade the therapy. And so that's, that's the models that we built and uh, what was central to my research was to identify a predictive biomarker, which was, which was identified as a protein called protein kinase C alpha. And so that was the first hint that if we had high levels of this protein in the tumor, then the tumor became resistant to tamoxifen. And so we showed that many, many times. Um, but what we also found was that there wasn't this evolution that once the tumors progressed for a while, estrogen no longer stimulated the tumor, but estrogen actually inhibited the tumor, which was very counterintuitive, but in fact, very interesting because prior to the use of tamoxifen in the clinic, um, physicians used high dose estrogen to treat. And so um, I took this concept to Greg Thatcher, who is a medicinal chemist, and he's in a, a, a um, right down the hall from me, a laboratory. And he designed um, a, a compound, which we eventually called TTC352. And this compound was a partial, so it was a, a little bit weaker than estrogen itself, because estrogen in the clinic was very harsh treatment and had a lot of side effects. And so um, we, he developed and synthesized that drug and we tested it in our models. And that really formed the basis of the preclinical trials um, that led to the clinical trials that, that Arik will talk about in terms of uh, formation of, of the company. So it's, it's basically a, a form of estrogen or like a copy of estrogen that's e easier and better for the body? Is that what the drug is? It's a it's a, essentially a weaker estrogen. It's it's right, a it, it's it's much much weaker, and um, doesn't have the side effects that a high dose estrogen or the estrogen molecule would have. And so um, this was very evident in the clinical trials that that were completed, 
Um, the patients really had very minimal side effects, certainly much less than they experienced in with the other chemotherapies that they were undergoing. Um, and, you know, I think Ara can really speak to that because he was involved in, and ran the clinical trial. So that's the phase one. You guys completed that already and you had positive results on that? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Uh, How many people was in that in that type of study in a phase one? Yeah, it was very interesting. You know, we uh, sometimes for sort of phase one clinical trials can be very large, but ours was small, it was 15 patients because we met our goals. We didn't need to accrue more patients. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure that the drug is safe. So usually what you do, you start with very, very low dose and you increase the dose. This is a pill that's given, taken twice a day, oral medication, started with very low dose. And interesting, the um, uh, Federal Drug Administration, they look at our protocol and said, well, you know, you can just do it in one patient at a time. Usually you need to have multiple patients, make sure that it's safe, because they knew that the structure is, is, is very likely not going to be toxic. And that was actually true. So we went up to the maximum dose that we wanted going to test that was much higher uh, in efficacy as was tested in in uh, experimental animals. And so we knew that we have a right dose level, and yet even at the highest dose, we didn't see a toxicity. In fact, on a study that we've done, uh, one of the comments of the uh, uh, page, one of the patient's husband was that uh, she had her life back because she didn't have any more toxicity from chemotherapy and she was functioning very well and normally as as wife and a mother um, being on this drug that that actually worked for her as well. What were the side effects that people had beforehand? What what type of side effects did they have from chemotherapy? They they you know they did have and they were neuropathies, so decreased chance sensation in sensation in bottom of feet and hands and pain related to that. Uh, they had very low uh, white blood cell counts, infections risks because of white, low white cell count. Uh, they had nausea, they had vomiting, they had a potential problem with heart related to toxicity related to chemotherapy. So quite severe um, uh, toxicities that clearly impacted their li livelihood. Uh, this is oral agent and None of those um, uh, were experienced. Amazing. That's simply amazing. Now, what happened to the sizes of the tumors in the study? So there's no side effects, which is typically phase one anyway. You're looking for harmful things. But what did what did you see with the tumors uh, during that period? So, you know, we need to remember those that, that were women that had a multiple lines of treatments, meaning different regimens, different chemotherapies, uh, uh, on average, had around eight different regimens that were given to them before they joined the study. Some of them had 15 different regimens before they uh, joined in the study. So it was a sort of almost like a last straw of effort. Uh, and yet, out of those 15 women, four of them had clearly a, a benefit of having disease control, especially two of them had uh, more than six months of disease control um, meaning uh, the, no symptoms related to, to, to breast cancer, no symptoms, no toxicity related to their drug therapy, and just going back to normal life that they had before they had diagnosis of breast cancer. Amazing. Um, guys, we're going to take a quick break here, and then we'll be right back. Remember, listeners, any questions at all, you can always feel free to give me a call. We'll be right back with Money Nation. All opinions expressed by Ed Gardner and or his guests on the Money Nation show are solely Ed Gardner's and or his guests' opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Cutter & Company or any of their affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Ed Gardner and or guests as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only in as an expression of their opinion. Ed Gardner's and his guests' opinions are based on information he considers reliable, but neither Cutter & Company nor affiliates and or subsidies warrant its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. Always talk to your financial advisor before making such decisions. Welcome back to Money Nation. Guys, tell us about your next step. You had some really good results on the phase one. Tell us about how phase two is going to uh, operate. Tell us about how many people are going to be in the in the trial and uh, any, anything else about it. 
Yeah, this is really fascinating. And, and I think it's going to be making a huge impact on the way we treat uh, breast cancer. Um, what we need to do really in order to move this uh, therapy forward, eventually to be available to everyone, every patient with breast cancer and hormone uh, uh, that has failed hormone therapy is to demonstrate without any doubt that what we've seen in the phase one clinical trial uh, is actually true, meaning that yes, we can have significant impact on disease control with this drug. We're planning to do a, a study that will be by chance assigning women with breast cancer to our drug versus whatever physician oncologist feels is right for, for, for that uh, patient population. And what we hope to see that number one, that we're going to see better activity, better du duration of disease control on our drug. And the secondly, that will demonstrate by without any doubts that our drug is better tolerated uh, than anything else. No, definitely not, not the chemotherapy, uh, that better than chemotherapy. So this study is going to be a large study. It's going to be a more than 100 patients study uh, that hopefully with the results of that study, we can come to Federal Drug Administration to guide us what, what will be the next step. Um, usually the next step is to, to actually perform even larger study. If there is a extraordinary results, uh, FDA might actually look at that and say, we, we will have a sort of breakthrough as designation with this drug, and therefore we will we can accelerate uh, approval. So, but we are at the moment, we are at this very important time that that we need to show without any doubt that the drug is active. We know it's safe. Now we need to show that it's active and it's better in activity or or in in, in toxicity and whatever physician will decide to do. So that's phase two is to make sure that it's that it's active, the, the actual drug, you've proven that it's safe. So you'll do some more proof of safety, but active is what you really want to see in the phase two with a hundred patients. That's all you need. You don't need any more than a hundred patients for. Well, you know, it's above, above 100, you know, we, we designed it specifically. I can give you the number 173 to be exact. Uh, okay. uh, but, uh, 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 that that will be, uh, I, I think, results of the study will be very uh, uh, important in the context of whether to continue the drug development or not. Um, usually, you require even larger in that study around 300 or even 400 patients to have a finally drug approved for its indication. How long is the study going to last? It really depends on, on how many sites, uh, a clinical sites will open, how many different institutions will have access to the tri start trial. If Is this we, phase two you're talking about? You're talking about the yeah, phase two, right? Okay. Phase two. So if it's 107 patients, uh, it's a still a very large study. So it will require opening that study at least you know, 10 or even 20 different clinical sites. So we can accrue, meaning patients will come to that study um, in uh, and it can finish the accrual within within two years, ideally, and that results will be analyzed and and uh, will guide us, uh, in whether to 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 start even larger study for for um, for a, a federal drug administration approval. That may take uh, you know another three, four, five years. Phase two or phase is that phase three, phase three you're talking about? Phase three. Phase three. Now, phase two, if it goes well enough, you could get a fast track approval. How does that work? And what do you need to see to possibly get that, you know, that term? You need to have some extraordinary uh, activity of the drug uh, in order uh, to have that uh, sort of fast track approval. What it means is that um, with the results of that phase two clinical trial, you can then go in, have a very uh, as, a good conversation with federal drug administration, get their advice. How would they, you know, what is necessary 
to uh, to be done in order to to bring this uh, drug as soon as possible uh, to uh, general population of uh, women with breast cancer. Um, and uh, what is necessary is to show that uh, that is it's, it is a very active uh, agent and really uh, in comparison, what else is available is 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 much better in a, in a context of activity, but also uh, safety and toxicity. What does breast cancer uh, rank as far as the cancers for women? Is it one? I know it's one of the top ones, right? It's as far as yeah, it's in incidence. It's a number one. Number uh, one. Number one. Number one. Number one. Mm-hmm. Now I see you guys raise some money. Now obviously all these trials take cash, <laughs> a lot of cash. So you raised six and a half million dollars. What's the next step on that? Uh, we'd be raising money for the second phase. Yeah, we we are in uh, in fundraising time right now to bring a sufficient amount of funds to um, produce sufficient amount of drug in order to uh, to continue with the phase two clinical trial. So we made a. Uh, 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 several efforts. We we, we talk to potential investors, um, a, and we also do crowdfunding, uh, reaching out just to the general public to support this research. What about other drug companies? When would you possibly partner with someone? When what type of data do they want to see? Do they want to see phase two data before they would think about partnering, or they don't want to partner with phase one? Do they? We have the discuss. We had already several discussions. Uh, with several uh, really major uh, pharma companies uh, that have uh, markets around the world, whole world. And um, they are interested in phase two data. Uh, that's that's key. key. So they want to see that. So you're going to raise the money outside of other uh, partnerships in the time being. How much money do you need to raise for a phase two study? Uh, at, at, at least fifteen million dollars. We need to. We 15? need to fifteen million dollars. Fifteen million. Interesting. I imagine a lot of people have reached out to you, have suffered from this terrible disease. How do you handle that? What do you What do you tell to them? Do they people ever say, "I want to get my my mother in in one of the studies"? Because I'm sure a lot of times people are desperate and they want to do whatever they can to help their loved ones. Oh, yeah, we we yeah. actually that actually happened. Uh, you know, to, to you know, we 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 were contacted with by number of either patients uh, uh, or the family members asking us, you know, can we participate in clinical trial? Uh, and you know, unfortunately, uh, at this point, we cannot offer the the medication. We really wanted uh, to offer that uh, medicine to to in participation in clinical trial, but cannot do that. What we uh, suggest is to um, to, to those individuals who reach out to us to really talk to um, their medical oncologist and to inquire um, regarding any clinical research that is going on um, and to be part, part of that. I think this is extremely important to move the whole science forward because um, uh, there are numbers of different strategies being developed uh, for different cancers. Can people get involved in the phase two trial individually or they have to go through a certain hospital that's involved with the trial? Usually there are specific what we call clinical research sites that are identified uh, by a clinical research organization that would work with us. Um, and so if that site has the study open, patients uh, will need to come to that site. Now they can come from a different city, from a different location, and uh, the studies, all the studies are re- being uh, registered with clinicaltrials.gov. And there's information, what site has opened, who is responsible uh, for um, uh, uh, checking eligibility and how to contact that specific site. So this is available to to, uh, to patients. How many sites do you think guys are planning on having out there for phase two? You know, I was thinking about 20 different clinical sites. Um, that'd be nice that's spread out all across the country I, I think you easily get your your 170 people you know especially are you going to look for people that are farther along in the disease or people that just just got it no this patients uh you know we we have a good treatments right now that evolved for for patients who just got it 
and I think that, that specific uh, niche that this drug was developed for uh, the, for those who already uh, had a disease progressing on, okay. on, okay. on last on, last resort on, type of drug. Not last, I would say third, third line. <laughs> okay, okay. As, in cancer research, it's a really a lot of things are happening these days. The White House uh, has a moonshot to cure cancer. Arca. You're associated with the Mayo Clinic. What makes you a rock star in the cancer world? You're seeing general terms of cancer research and our expectations during these terrible afflictions. What are you, what are you seeing? This is a really exciting time. This exciting time program started, uh, I would say, uh, at least 10 years ago. Uh, when I started my uh, initial practice in medical oncology, there are not many treatments available. And there was a terrible stigma of having cancer. That is changing. You know, the fact that we are mo making a transformation of cancer to so-called chronic disease, such as diabetes or hypertension, uh, this is clearly what we see. Uh, a lot of patients are uh, having disease control, having normal life, um, and uh, uh, this is happening. Uh, uh, so the options are available, multiple different research uh, uh, experimental trials are available. Novel therapy is being approved uh, every year. Uh, so I see a huge, huge uh, improvement in the way we we approach cancer and manage it. One of my the favorite... Uh, to... can... What's that, Deborah? I was just going to say the goal is to make it a chronic disease, to just control it as you would a chronic disease and to live with it and to live with it. Yeah. Um, Sounds like the first phase you see the people were, were that, that was happening to them. So that's really promising right there. What's the chances of the TTC oncology drug can be the next revelment or, or something uh, along those lines? Well, we definitely hope that uh, we're going to have the same success story. Um, I think that for more important for us is actually the uh, testimonials from our patients that they did tolerate it very well. They have the disease control. That's what we're going for. Um, uh, we want to bring this drug to the general patient population with breast cancer. So, Ark, do you have any more closing comments at all on what we talked about? I'm very excited to uh, to continue working with uh, with the drug. I really want to have this available for women with breast cancer that uh, failed other therapies. Uh, my sentiment is is uh, shared by other oncologists uh, treating. Uh, breast cancer. They really want to have this drug available initially through the phase two clinical trial. Uh, I hope that we will be able to open that study very soon. Sounds very fascinating, really interesting. The phase one results were really remarkable. And uh, I can see how you guys are really excited about this. Uh, what's your best of luck on uh, phase two? And we'd love to talk to you guys more about it. I want to hear how these uh, the next phase and the next chapter in TTC oncology goes. Absolutely. It will be our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Art, it. Deborah, thank you both very much for being with us on Money Nation. Remember, clients, any questions at all, always feel free to give me a call at 518-255-8854. And you can always go back and listen to all of our previous interviews on YouTube under searching Money Nation. Thank you very much for listening today on Money Nation. Have a good day. <laughs>